views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Welcome to Bronx Talk. The Jerome Park Reservoir is one of the most iconic and historic features in the Bronx. Although it covers 94 acres in a dense part of the North Bronx, it's on the National Register of Historic Places and is much beloved, especially by the communities that surround it. It's the subject of ongoing disagreement between the Department of Environmental Protection, who are charged with managing it, and local residents. The latest is disagreement over the DEP's plan to leave the North Basin of the reservoir unfilled, and also their plans to repair damaged historic stone walls with a concrete substance. As the city prepares its construction, the disagreement is quite unresolved as advocates continue to discover discrepancies in the way the reservoir is operated and also fundamental issues with the nearby Croton treatment plant. It is a complex situation. And a lot of people have heard about it, but they don't fully understand it. Tonight, we have two experts with us to help us unravel the latest from the Bronx Council of Environmental Quality, President Bob Fanuzzi. Nice to have you with us, sir. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. And the secretary is Karen Argenti. Nice to have you with us. Okay. And uh, by the way, both sit on community boards, eight uh, sanitation and environment committee. Uh, folks, um, welcome to the program. You. Uh, you know, it's almost like I don't know where to begin. Mm -hmm. as, as you both know, this has been a 20 plus year uh, uh, legacy or saga. Um, so, Mr. Fanuzzi, let's just start with you. The, the plan to leave the North Basin empty, it's a beautiful reservoir. Why would anybody want to have it not be a reservoir and, and uh, have it be empty for, what is it, about a third of the reservoir? Right. So, Gary, thanks for the question. Um, just so the community knows, this is a longstanding relationship between two things, the plant and the reservoir. Um, and these two things became really intertwined and almost um, brought to a level of a community crisis. And, and let me just interject, the plant is located not too far away at the, uh, at the, the old Marshallu Golf Course. Former Marshallu Golf Course. Maybe plant. eventually again a golf course. Uh, um, up there uh, on Jerome Avenue and uh, right where the Woodlawn train uh, terminates. Go ahead. So this Sorry. recent controversy has really reminded us how intertwined the Jerome Park Reservoir is with this plant because... Um, starting in June of 2019, um, we received a presentation from the Department of Environmental Protections about the latest update of their plans to rehabilitate the east wall of the Jerome Park Reservoir. Okay, Now, this has deteriorated over time. And one of the reasons it's deteriorated is because it's been empty for so long. And so they needed to have a structure. Let's clarify two things. First of all, the east wall is that wall that's on Goulden Avenue near uh, right what in front of Education Row in right. front of Lehman right. and uh, Bronx Science. Mm -hmm. uh, at the other end is Clinton. The other end is Walton. Uh, so that's the wall on the interior. That's right. And what you're saying is because it, ha there had, been, it had been empty for so long, uh, the wall is used to having water there, and it like got uh, contaminated by the air and other elements, and it deteriorated. It was a required capital project, right? So we thought we were going to hear about the latest and some controversy about differences in substance because um, there was st laid stone originally created by the Italians who built the reservoir back in the 30s, mm -hmm. okay? So the DEP had proposed to spray concrete, but... Everything that was new and sprayed concrete was, in all their approvals up until this meeting in, in June, below the waterline. So you wouldn't be able to see. Right. Completely neutral with regard to environmental impact and impact on view, impact on the community. So DEP had got all the approvals, and then there was a new phase when they came to us in June. And the new phase was that 
because of an operational change in the Croton filtration monitoring plant to the north, right? Okay, and the requirement to have an empty basin in case of an emergency shutdown, the north basin would remain permanently empty. Okay, I just have to stress that this is not up and down to test the plant, not to uh, do maintenance, but permanently but per empty. For an emergency fail-safe measure. And so then I guess enter uh, Ms. Argenti, you, actually both of you, went up to Albany to talk to the State Historic Preservation Organization, or Office of State Historic Preservation, and um, explain to them that this would, leaving it empty and barren, would impact the community. Right, so um, we call it SHPO, S-H-P-O, State Historic Preservation Office, and SHPO wrote a letter in May, before we got the presentation at the community board, and their letter said that there was no impact to what the DEP was proposing. Having, having the North Basin empty. Having the North Basin em and using this extra shot creek right, stuff. Which was the, the concrete the stuff. Concrete they were going to put on it. And um, we went up and we said, we think you made a mistake, that you didn't look at everything, that water is a really critical part of it. The reservoir is a very important part of our whole history in the area. Um, and could you take another look and see maybe there was something wrong with the way that the new reviewer, it was also a new reviewer, the new reviewer looked at this project. And please let us know if you're ever going to do this again because we probably have more information on this project than you will get from the DEP. And the surrounding communities as well. Right. And all the surrounding communities. And so then ultimately, uh, and I'll move it forward, they reversed their decision. Mm -hmm. And um, then I guess you heard from the Department of Environmental Protection who said, okay, so we're not going to leave the reservoir empty. Mm. We're going to what? Five you to know? eight feet of water. They'll put five which, to eight feet of water. Which is basically empty. We have photographs. I, I want to show some of these photographs of what the North Basin would look like with uh, essentially five to eight And they feet never of water. decided to take away the, the view. They didn't say they were going to keep the five to eight, eight feet of water covering whatever the construction was. They're still going to do the construction up to 15 feet, and we're going to see like some ugly white blob of concrete. Yeah, you, you can see there that, um, you know, you can see a lot of that wall. Yeah, you, you could see it right up here. You could see that a lot of the, the wall is showing, uh, so even, uh, you know, five to eight feet is nice, but it doesn't uh, cover all the way. And this is a beautiful stone wall. It doesn't have gravel in the middle of it. It's almost an artistic feature of the reservoir. And so, you know. Here's another look. You can see that's what it would look like if it was still yes. exposed. So, so that was not satisfactory. Um, I, I, either of you can answer because I know you're both well familiar with it. Um, why do they need to empty uh, the, the filtration plant? You want, you want to address that, Mr. Finuzzi? So we heard at the Croton Filtration Monitoring Committee many years ago that the plant would be installed without an emergency generator. In Electric case, generator. Electrical generator, almost like a stand substation. By. A standby. And um, DEP insisted that this was not feasible, and they actually got letters from the Department of Health saying they didn't need to do anything further. So because of the troubles with the site and because of the troubles with getting electrical power sufficient to run the plant at the site, they were given clearance basically to proceed without this required backup. So JPR is the cost of that omission. Well, now, now why is that? So, uh, Well, it's a little bit more than that because what they said was... See, I, I told you folks this was going <laughs> to be complicated, but it's real important because this is a facility that, that you know, a, a lot of people right. surround. They said without a permit. They don't have a waiver from the State Department. They only have a letter. Mm -hmm. They said that it was okay because they would have a backup source of water because there's three suppl water supplies. There's the Croton, the Catskill, and the Delaware. And so they said, don't worry about it because you, if you don't get, they're only worried about giving water to the distribution system. Mm -hmm. So if you will be able to supply water to everybody. What they didn't say is they wouldn't be able to supply electricity to the plant. And so that if the, if the, if the plant uh, has an emergency, and, and I know there was a little bit of experience this with the, uh, in this with the, the, the Queens thing that happened a little while back. Yeah. Um, if the plant has an emergency, the water will keep rushing into the plant, right. but because the plant is not functioning, 
They could, they could be. No, 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 no. The water is not rushing into the plant. No. The only way the water gets into the plant is, the is, the is from the Jerome Park Reservoir. The pumps to pull it into the plant because it's up further than Jerome Park right. Reservoir. Those pumps are located in the plant. If the plant doesn't have electricity, the water is going to flow into the Jerome Park Reservoir, and we're all going to be flooded. Right. Yeah. So, so. They, so that's why they say they need a place to put it in so, case the electricity. But there are other there. alternatives. Yes. You don't so, have to okay. always now, they, let they, you do that, and then you can weigh in. This is why we believe it's a fatal mistake for DEP to skirt an environmental impact statement. Because given the fact of this mistake that didn't have an emergency generator, number one, and given the fact that they do need to allow for this emergency, they should recognize that this falls under state environmental law and that the plan itself needs to revise its environmental impact statement based on this newfound need to have an emergency fail-safe. So there are alternatives they should be required to document and present in public. Right now, all we've got from DEP is, ah, that didn't work, ah, that didn't work. It's all hearsay. Nothing's been documented. Nothing's been proven. There are measures in the law to for city agencies to show their reasoning. And that's why you believe they need to do an EIS. Absolutely. Is there any, you know, okay, so now we've established that there's no backup uh, electrical power mm -hmm. at the plant. Right. Is there a chance to say, well, why don't you do that and build that? One mm -hmm. would presume that would be that an alternative. That would be an alternative, but another it's alternative, expensive. you got to find space. Another I mean, alternative would be to open up the aqueduct so that they could discharge the water into a, a, in an emergency. A in, in an emergency into a shaft into the Harlem River which they did before in, and, in 2015 and, when they were testing out the right. plants. And Gary, okay. all, all they would need is to add a, a electric valves to these shafts yeah. because they have to be on site. It's not as, as devastating to the community as emptying a reservoir. This is the most impactful action, and state law requires that they should seek the least. And, and what or who can force them to do that, or is it just a matter of you presenting, and we're presenting it on TV, and you're presenting common sense? So and, the, the you know. SHPO letter, which uh, <laughs> said we changed our mind, is still in the process of deciding how the conversation is going to go between the DP and the state. And that is going, so the thing that they need to do is it depends on what is going to happen when they come together and talk about the different things. One of the things that's in our favor is if they want to take the water out of the reservoir, they are going to have to do, a, because it's a state and national on the state and national register, they will have to do an environmental impact statement. Period, and, but the they're end. still saying no. But that's, it's, it's very clear. It's in SHPO. It's in the law. It's in the statement that they 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 filed, and they were never in favor of it being come on the state and national register. I, I want to show this photograph that that was very interesting to me. Uh, and and listen, let's be honest. Many people know that I live right near the reservoir, and so I I know these people very well, and I've been personally involved outside of my my media work. But I want to show this photograph, which shows you a part of what's on the northern part. If we could we could pull up that uh, photograph, that's what's on the northern part of. Um, uh, uh, the reservoir, if you look at the entire area that is um, uh, surrounding that, and, and we're, we're going to get the photo up there in a second, you'll see on the right there's Tracy Towers, which is a huge complex, there's Dewitt Clinton High School, there's uh, Bronx, uh, uh, North Bronx, uh, North Central Bronx Hospital, Montevideo Hospital, mm -hmm. there's Public School 95, mm -hmm. Amalgamated Houses is there. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly if you keep going around, there's Scott Tower, uh, there's Park Reservoir and Mutual Housing. I mean, this is a very populous community and you can see the reservoir sticks right into that. What I don't understand, and I'm going to ask the question editorially, how could anyone think they could operate a water system or a facility like that and shut it off from this community? This is, this is not like just a couple of buildings and a couple of people. So in the history there. of this community, because I went back to try to figure out how did Amalgamated say, how did Amalgamated decide in the beginning of the century that they were going to buy that piece of land and going to build the whole complex there? What made them do that? The people who came from the Lower East Side and were in a, a tenement and had no light right. and, you know, neat, and they wanted a park. They wanted a park on one side, which is Van Cortland Park, and they wanted the park reservoir on the other side. So they would be protected that they wouldn't end up into the place that they were at. And I guess that reinforces what my point was. 
how can you have a facility that's so integrated with the community? Right. And, and it's yeah. a rhetorical question, I suppose, at, so at this point. We asked Commissioner Sapienza to take a good hard look at the SHPO letter and its ringing statement of the impact of Jerome Park Reservoir on the building of a great community. Once upon a time, public works and residential development were not antithetical. In fact, like Karen says, they were integral. And the fact that there was an operational um, part of the water system here was the reason why Jerome Park uh, community developed. It was always supposed to augment and complement each other. He's got to reach back into the his reading of Seeker, the state environmental law, he's got to reach back into the reason JPR is here and look at those documents, look at these pictures and say that this will not destroy the community that the reservoir helped create. Uh, I, I want to just also, I, we've got a bunch of photos and you can do, folks can just throw them up there and we'll take a look at them. These are pathways that are around the interior of the reservoir. Many of us, I recall that there was a hands around the reservoir in the 90s yeah. where people came out. We've had a couple of uh, examples of um, uh, more recently where people were allowed to walk on the interior. The local community loved it. Is there any chance or is that like further away to uh, figure out no, when these and are where. all things that we are going to work on. Our, our future plans are we're asking the DEP to put together a citizens advisory committee as part of their environmental impact statement process because we just assume that they're going to have to do it one way or the other and part of it is to get uh, a connection around the whole reservoir. I actually call it the Jerome Park Reservoir Commons and so the Commons which is pulling us all together. We'll talk about all our problems, all our concerns, things that have to be taken care of, including the Jerome Park Reservoir. I have to tell you, this just makes a lot of sense to me. Based on that photograph that I showed you, you can't, you can't divorce it and fence it off, especially when it's not only that people live there, you have schools. I mean, think of, you know, that walkway between there. People could literally walk from one part mm -hmm. of the Bronx to another, yeah. to schools, yeah. to the Lehman Center for the mm -hmm. Performing Arts. I mean, all this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I, I want to also address one other item that has come up along the way, and that's the notion of the State Preservation Historic uh, uh, Shippo. Shippo's uh, yeah. uh, re-decision here. The DEP said at your meeting that they don't have to follow that because they don't receive we federal funding. We don't believe funding. that they're correct. I have actually done research, and in 1938, the WPA, which is the... The, the Project Works, Pro Works Progress Project Administration. Pro Work oh, Works Planning Workforce and Project Administration. Administration, where they... In hired people years. to do work. They did it in different categories, mostly parks, but they did do utilities. And I have found two projects that were funded by the federal government, which means that this is now a project that has received funding from the federal government, and therefore it's an EPA 106 thing. So then they would have to follow the various guidelines of what they called Section 106, which right. would include interacting with the community. And, what, and a, what a revelation. So, and an um, EIS and consulting parties, which BCQ oh, right. and the community would be. So, Gary, the only good thing that's come out of this is the just incredible revival for a new generation of the GP, uh, JPR activism that began in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, BCQ and the organizations around the reservoir are really not just stakeholders, and that's what the government calls us. The Jerome, we, i got to interject. The Jerome Park friends and neighbors go around that reservoir, uh, and they, they, they garden, they right. fix up the thing, yeah, yeah. And, you've got, and they keep getting more and more people. Yeah. People love that reservoir. Communities, Bronx communities love that reservoir. We made the mistake of believing the city was something that we should participate in, and especially this beautiful reservoir. So please don't make us look like fools because everyone loves this neighborhood. The growth of the neighborhood is tied to the beauty of the reservoir. There are people ready to go make this a uh, beautiful connection of parks, including that great idea for We Love JPR Do Day. You, uh, would you accept having our water contaminated? In other words, is, is, that, is it like a case of one or the other? Because the, I've been it's at not. meetings no. and the DEP says, the raw water. You, know, we have to, uh, you know, we have to keep the water it's clean. It's the raw water, yeah. and it's, it's, uh, it gets filtered after this. And actually, the only reason this is a problem is because there will be one day when they close the Delaware, there will only be two water sources. 
And when that time happens, then you, you need... You say they're going to close it for repair? Repair, five to eight months. What's the big deal? Five to eight months, you know. You got to repair it. You okay. repair it, and then you open it up again, and now you have three. But during that time when you only have two, there's this problem that in case there's a down, if the croton goes down or the Catskill goes down, neither one of them is going to be able to supply enough water to the city of New York because there just is not enough water. Hmm. Uh, I want to bring up something else which uh, has come up, uh, and I know that both of you have been sitting around meetings and discussing this. The, the site where the uh, filtration plant is built, mm -hmm. everybody knows, as I said, it's up at the end of the, the number four train in, in Woodlawn up there. Um, uh, that, that was park land that was alienated to the objection of uh, many in the community, but it was alienated and they built this underground plant. Now I understand, and we can show some of the photographs, that they have actually extended the boundaries of the area that was alienated. Right, right. I mean, it's like anybody. You can't go in and just start building on parkland. There you can see a, a fence that was uh, put up uh, to, you know, because they were starting to cordon off more of the, uh, of, of the area. Go ahead. So, Gary, think of a square, which is the zone of alienation created right. by the, yeah, um, the state legislature, and right. then think of a larger circle on top of the square. And those overlap zones... That skirt circle is the plant. By the way, it's not underground. It's 30 feet high. But, uh, allegedly, it was supposed to be underground. But here's a, the best example. The, the area on the right, the, the fence on the right, was the original boundaries. And then all of a sudden, they said, well, we want to uh, extend it. So actually, are, are they breaking the state regulation of doing that? Yeah. Or have they applied? Or where no, are we at? No, they haven't. And so what happened is we told them that it's a lot of groundwater here. They started building, and they found a lot of groundwater. So they devised a system. Groundwater, in other words, because they did dig the they thing down. They went down 10 stories. Well, maybe they only went down seven stories because the thing is popping up out of the ground, three stories. Right. So they went down seven to 10 stories. And you and, told them, don't go we, down because there's going to be water. The mother of all leaky basements is what they got, which yeah. is what we told them. Right. And um, the water needs to go someplace. So they've been pumping it into the sewer. They can't continue to do that because they got a problem with too much water. So they have to take care of it. So they put these little cells that they call wetlands, but they're uh, all uh, made on the exterior on of outside, outside the square. And that's taken <laughs> up extra land so that if you did it, if it was underwater, under the ground, we wouldn't even notice it. But because it pops up, over the ground, it's so going Gary, to be uh, Gary, taking up area that's uh, and, and not as out. I understand, they're taking down 85 trees. 85 trees. So the point of contention <laughs> is not only the trees, which we're going to get back somewhere. Well, but, but that's another but issue. We'll talk a about a lot about more Are, than 85. Is, is this a park's use? Um, In other words, because, you can't you can't alienate land or you can't build on land that is. If it's returned to park's use, then you've stayed within your square. But if this circle contains non-park uses. You've got trouble. So they uh, allegedly would have had to go back to the state legislature and say, we need more land for this yeah. project. So I don't believe that Parks wants to operate a filtration plant. But that's what these cells are for, to take care of the extra water that bubble up from underground. So what, what changes that? What addresses that? Is that a lawsuit that has I to be? I don't know. It's up to the agencies <laughs> to look at. Help! Yeah. <laughs> But those little cells that Karen was talking about, they're actually required for getting rid of the water from the plant, and it's up to the parks to decide if it's theirs. If they feel that this is a park's use and belongs to the parks, then it's... You, you had been the chair of the community board, now you're on the, the, uh, you know, the chair of the, um, uh, the Sanitation and Environment Committee. If they, the numbers I saw, so they were going to take down 85 trees, they said they're going to replace them with 1,400 trees. Yeah. As I understand the rules, they call it wood for wood. Mm -hmm. It's the diameter of the trees. Mm -hmm. That would suggest that the 85 trees they're taking down are very Big. large trees oh, yeah. because trees. they're going to replace them with little right. sticks. Is it, right, correct. They're big. They're, they're big trees. Not, have they gone down yet or they're going? And they're, I, I don't think they're down yet. They're still... Well. Um, so we have a few minutes left. Let's uh, somehow wrap this up. So what... <laughs> I, I hope people have been following this. Partially because it's it's you know it's it's a huge facility in the middle of of you know thousands, tens of thousands of Bronx people. So w what's next? What happens next? Well, we just need to have continue to have a conversation with the DEP about what their responsibilities are, 
and how they. And, and you believe that one of those responsibilities is to do an a, a full environmental they assessment. They need to re renew, remove the the environmental uh, assessment that they have now, which is really bogus. It's not correct. Mm -hmm. They need to remove a conditional neg deck also. They need to start. What does that mean, neg it, deck? They, that's where they put the thing it's where a we're negative be, declaration that it wasn't going to have an impact. Okay. Taking away the water and doing the shot creek. They need to remove that. They need to start anew. They need to have a good conversation with Chippo. They need to organize, um, you know, a way that the community can participate. And you called it a CAC, a community citizens Act advisory. We're going to start community. without them because we're not going to be like we're going to be up and running before they even get there, right. and um, and people have enough things to talk about about the reservoir that that it, it will be worthwhile. Mr. Fanuzzi, you uh, fortunately or unfortunately deal with a lot of these, have dealt with a lot of these city agencies and, and DEP. Oh, and, and we other... need a meeting with the FMC because uh, there's the a plan. The Facilities Monitoring committee. committee needs to be meet, meeting. Um, yeah. About this. Um, I, how, how do you force them? I mean, uh, again, I, I bring up the notion of lawsuit, but of course that involves paying for lawyers and, yeah. and a whole thing which I guess nobody really wants to deal with. How, how do you get them to listen to the things that Ms. Argenti is saying? Well, we've done a good start by having two solid resolutions from the community board that really brought the the erroneous no impact statement to Shippo's attention. So we really have a record of, and thanks to Assemblyman Dinowitz, I have to say, everyone should know that Assemblyman Dinowitz got us to the table with the State Shippo, Historic right? Preservation Office. So we are looking for that same kind of support to get to the table with the commissioner. We would like this to be at the commissioner level. And BCQ has spent, what, 48 years providing policy guidance and oversight and good government advice to DEP for decades. So you want to interact with the from the top and we, not have we, underlings we, say it and then have a decision because made we're us. not getting the transparency and disclosure at that level. We mm. think we've earned the right to be heard at that level and to be told exactly what's wrong with their application. Uh, people who uh, want to participate or want to ask questions, they go to BCQ on Facebook. What mm -hmm. are you Absolutely, yes. No, we, and we have a web page, bcq.org. Dot org. And, and, uh, we have and a, April 22nd is our annual meeting. Right. Everybody should come out, and we will have a JPR question and answer session. And we invite all it's city birthday, agents. birthday, birthday. Yep. Uh, well, you know, I uh, don't know if we've raised more questions <laughs> and give answers because it's a, it's a difficult problem. As, as that photograph I showed you, it's in the center of, of many communities, of important institutions, and I think we need to have dialogue. I've been doing we this for run. years. Yeah. We just have to keep going. Uh, Karen Argenti, thank you. Bob yeah. Fanuzzi, thank, thank you. you. Gary. Folks, if you have further questions on anything you heard on tonight's show or anything going on in the Bronx, email them to us at bronxtalk at bronxnet.org. Send us a tweet at Bronx Talk or post them on our Facebook page. Next week, Senator Gustavo Rivera will be here. Uh, he will be our guest, and he'll discuss uh, the coronavirus and how prepared are we in uh, New York State and what is going on in Albany as regards health reform and another uh, bunch of other uh, subjects he'll talk with us about. He's the chair of the Senate's Health Committee, and that's why we'll talk to him about those things. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we thank our producer, uh, is uh, Yesenia Ramos, and our director is Richard Diaz. We'll see you next week. Good night.